Atlanta sailing to Antarctica. I had. So, when a friend of mine who had built her own sailing steel boat asked me if I wanted to join, oh, I said, yes, yes, of course I want to join. For you who don't know me, my name is Linda. I teach women to sail and 2016 to 19, I sailed around the world with women crew. To come to Antarctica, you have to cross the Drake's Passage, 500 miles on one of the world's most feared seas. You know, the roaring 40s, furious 60s and screaming 60s. And the reason why it is so feared is the regular gales, but also the sea state. The fetch is enormous. The waves can build up all the way around the Antarctic continent. And then you also have the icebergs. From the latitude 40 and over, you risk to encounter icebergs. The reward is the pristine landscape, fearless penguins, and all those colors that are created only from snow and light. Ten years ago, I met Milo Dahlman in Ushuaia, southern Argentina. She had sailed there all the way from Sweden in her 10 meter steel boat. And I flew there together with Anders, one of her friends. Uh, Ushuaia is a city centered around tourist trips to the Patagonian fjords and mountains, and also boat trips to Antarctica. You can cross the Drake's Passage on a cruising ship or on a sailing boat. And there are many sailing boats in the harbor there. There are many French boats, and uh, many of them take on cruise. Ushuaia is also a city of uh, artificial penguins, made out of all the materials you can think of, and for all purposes you can think of. The preparations took us a couple of weeks. We sold food and Milo and Anders, they worked on some engine troubles and I tried to make the computer work together with the sound card and the SSB radio to take down grid files. But this sound card didn't work well together with the SSB radio. So we created a model with a satellite phone that I had borrowed from a friend of mine and uh, we did send and got text messages with weather forecasts on that one. And also, of course, we used all of those radio amateurs that are around the world giving weather forecasts to all sailors. We are still on land, the boat is prepared, and we have moved along the Beagle Channel to a small city, Puerto Williams, in Chile. And the reason why we are in Chile is that we have been told that if we need to seek shelter in Lee of any of those small islands north of Cape Horn, we need to be cleared in to Chile. And as you can see, the lows come rolling from the west in a regular pace and they crush into the southern tip of, of South America. But then further down, it's much cal calmer. So we thought on the way back, it would be maybe hard to avoid coming into one of those gales. And after one week of monitoring the weather forecast from Puerto Williams Library's very, very slow computer, there was a perfect weather window. We tried to stock up with some more fresh vegetables, but it turned out that the well-stocked food stores, they were only open for the militaries. Finally, the day has come to leave. We had 60 miles to go from Puerto Williams out to Copeland Sea. It got dark, I took the watch after having slept a couple of hours and I got immediately seasick. But the next day came with sunshine and albatrosses.
need a permit to sail to Antarctica and you probably need special insurance because most of the travel insurances they exclude those remote areas like Antarctica. And before leaving we had to sign papers that we were going to sail on the high seas and that we understood the consequences. I was scared. I had only done one overnight sail before from Morocco over to uh, Canary Islands. That was four nights. And uh, I had never been in more than 35 knots of wind. I didn't know what to expect. I had nightmares of icebergs and Titanic and I was afraid to freeze. So what I brought with me was two base layers of wool. These base layers are made in a city in the northern part of Sweden, so I trusted them highly, of course. And then I also had uh, a down sweater, a very thick and very warm one. The problem was that down gets damp after a while. So the first week it worked very well, but then it got too damp, it wasn't warm anymore, and it didn't dry out properly until I came back. And also, of course, I had a foul weather sailing gear. And that worked well. I actually didn't freeze, although we had, as the coldest on the way down, we had four Celsius degrees inside the cockpit. And, and wool is a wonderful material. You can use it several days. It doesn't smell bad. And if it starts feeling dirty and smelly, you can just hang it out a few hours and then it's like fresh again. The weather window was almost too good. We had two days without wind and had to motor and used a little too much of our diesel supply. After five days we sighted the first icebergs and soon after Deception Island. Deception Island is a caldera of a volcano that had its last eruption in 1969. And our first steps on land was noticed by a chin strap penguin that was very curious and came closer and closer and we had signed papers that we should not go closer to penguins than 5 meters so I had to drop the camera and run away. We continued south to Enterprise Island. There you can tie up to the wreck of the Norwegian whale hunting ship Governoran that caught fire and stranded there in 1950. This was our first close encounter with the growlers, those mini icebergs that float around. And as you can see, it is so much bigger under the water than what you can see over the water. To navigate, we had electronic charts and paper charts. But we didn't trust them 100%. Not that you should ever trust charts 100%. But on these ones you could read thanks to ship so-and-so from 1954 and similar. And then you could easily imagine that there were shallows that nobody had run into yet. We also had a book Southern Ocean Crossing. But from that one we mostly got historic information and information on where to find the different animals. For detailed information about the anchorages, we had hand-drawn charts made by previous sailors. There is around 100 boats per year that go to Antarctica. And of course you got the chart information, but also some comments about their experiences at that anchorages. Next stop was Kuverville, which is a penguin paradise. The penguins, when we arrived, some of them lay on their eggs and some chicks had already come out. And when we left, some of the chicks had already lost their baby fur. Penguins cannot fly. Their wings are more like fins, they, they use them when they swim and, and to keep balance when they are on land. And, and their feathers are more like fur and they are very, very greasy to keep them warm in the cold. Most penguins are monogamous. They meet up 
when the breeding season starts, lay mostly one egg, take turns in guarding the egg and then getting food for the chicks. Until the breeding season is, is, is over, the chicks are grown up and they all lead, swim around <laughs> the rest of the year and then the parent cup meet up at the same nest next year. There are no permanent inhabitants in Antarctica but around 70 re research stations and around 40 have staff all year round. And most of the anchorages are near the stations. And we went to, for example, Port Lockroy, an old abandoned British station that now is a museum. And um, you can see what the staff did in long winter nights. They played Monopoly or Firopoly that their local homemade game is made out of. And another station was the Admiral Brown in Paradise Bay, where the staff picked up some beers from the pile of snow and told us a horrifying story. In 1984, the whole station burned down. The leader of the station, that was also the physician, he set fire to the station because he had been ordered to stay there all winter and he did not want to stay. So to be evacuated, he put the station on fire. But then he told the rest of the staff what he had done so they could rescue themselves before the station burnt down. And then they were taken into another neighboring station. But it was already too late in the year, so they could not be evacu evacuated until the next spring. So the whole winter, this staff had to take turns in guarding this leader, this man, just to make sure that he didn't put that station to fire also. This is how we usually moored. We had the anchor in the bow and then four floating lines. And we needed those floating lines because of the tide current. I used to row with the floating lines and tie them to whatever I could find. We had big eyes of wire that we put around stones and then we tied the ropes to the wire. And uh, when I rowed away with the dinghy and uh, I tried to find a place where they were not that very sharp and big stones where I could take up the dinghy. And then I had to walk a bit to find a big stone that I could put our wire around. And then I was thinking, what would happen if the tide rose and uh, the dinghy would drift away? How would I come back to the boat? To this bay here, where we were waiting for a good weather window to sail back to mainland, came a boat with a French family. The husband had been to Antarctica before, and now he wanted to show it to his wife and his teenage children. The second day, a gale came. The bay was very deep, and in the middle of the night, the boat dragged into us. When I came up, I saw that they were driving forward with a boat, probably to re-anchor, and they got one of the floating lines in the propeller. He sent out his two kids in the dinghy to row against the wind, and I can still hear them yell, Papa, Papa, Papa. While trying to take up his anchor, obviously his anchor last was broken because he was dragging the anchor over the ground and in that taking up our anchor as well. And we were now dragging into the land because we had lost one of our floating lines too. So Milo was trying to drive and keep the boat away from land without running into one of the floating lines while I rode away to attach the line land again. We got it all sorted out and the next day the guy dived to try to take away the mooring lines. He had one swimsuit but he had bare feet and bare head and of course he couldn't stay down long. But then luckily the next day a huge French boat came and uh, we both tied next to them and they had diving equipment on board. So they could dive down, take away the floating lines and they discovered that they had got a crack in the hull near the shaft.
We left the anchorage a couple of days later and from another boat we heard this. The family had continued south, despite the fact that the season was coming to an end. When they arrived to the next anchorage, they had lost their propeller. And what happened after that, I don't know. The Antarctic Peninsula stretches from 63 to 68 degrees south. My hometown, Sundsvall, in the middle of Sweden, is on 62 degrees. And uh, the northern, the very northern tip of Sweden is on 69. And here you can see the average climate in Sundsvall. I mean, we swim in the summer, thanks to the Gulf Stream. Unfortunately, Anders fell ill, so seriously ill that we needed to call for help. The station's doctor sent him with a Coast Guard ship back to South Shetland Islands, and from there it was a special plane that took him to hospital in Punta Arenas. Luckily, he later recovered. After Anders had gone, Milo and I felt that it was time to return. From where we were, we had a better wind angle, but it was a little longer distance, 550 miles, and uh, the gales were piling up. And we waited around a week there, and uh, then uh, we decided to leave after all. I had a plane to catch, and you know, you shouldn't leave with that reason. But still, that was obviously the right reason, because we had an okay crossing. We had one more serious gale, but it was no danger. And those who did not leave when we did, they couldn't leave Antarctica for the next three weeks. It's ten years ago now. It's a long time and, and since then I have sailed around the world, but I would still say that Sail to Antarctica is the most special and spectacular thing I've ever done.